I want to start by uh, telling you, uh, expanding on what Dr. Huntoon said, why I ended up in the United States. Uh, I, I grew up in Thailand, Germany, and Nepal, but I'm originally from Canada. Five years ago, a number of events happened in my own family which made the decision for me. My wife needed a uh, bunionectomy, simple procedure. She waited two and a half years on the surgical waiting list. Never got it. Never got it. By the end, she had been given a cane, a walker, Vicodin, but not the surgery. Because it wasn't life-threatening. You know, she could still work and pay taxes. You know, no big thing. Just wait your turn. We have politicians in line in front of you and prisoners, so, you know, wait your turn. Um, by the time she got here, she basically had to get a titanium toe because the joint had deteriorated to the point where it was gone. My son was hit by a car. He was driving on his bicycle and um, he was uh, making an illegal U-turn, wasn't wearing a helmet. He was hit head-on by a car going 35 miles an hour. His head went through the windshield. He was unconscious on the pavement for three minutes, taken to emergency, waited three hours on a gurney in the hallway, got an x-ray, and was discharged. No CT, wasn't available. Same with Denise Richards, wasn't able to get a CT, just wasn't available. They said, skull isn't broken, you know, a couple stitches, it's bleeding a bit. And, and my mother, when she was diagnosed, this was in 97 with breast cancer, she was told that because she was over 65 years old, the only option was a radical mastectomy. That was it. Take it or leave it. That's all that's available. So after these events, I decided it's, this is not worth my health. Okay? Now, my wife, of course, is American, so from California. So for her, it was coming back. For me, I moved to the United States. It, when I was growing up in Thailand, of course, I went to an American school because of, it was during the Vietnam War. So I was kind of educated as an American in the system. But when I came down here, I started talking about Canadian health care. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not bashing Canadian health care. It, it's actually pretty good if you don't need it. Okay? <laughs> it's only if you need it that you find out it isn't. W what I'd like to do today is I'd like to help everybody to understand something that is kind of an abstract concept. Why don't Canadians hang their politicians from lampposts? Because of what's happening. Most Canadians say, it's not a bad system, you know? And, and you know, 80 to 90% of people aren't acutely or chronically ill at any time and don't need, you know, uh, the care. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not bad. Here's the picture, incidentally. Uh, I've been involved in the um, uh, healthcare caucus in the California Republican Party. Uh, and during, during the first one, that's when uh, Rudy, um, of course, announced his candidacy. So after that, he asked me if I would draft his health care reform policy. Now, let's start by explaining Canadian socialism. And the first question is for the bottle of Cravassier. First question, what kind of political agenda does this administration have? Obama administration. Fascism. Okay, Dr. Amerling, remember that. You've got the crevassier. Very good, exactly. And, and, and in Canada, they have a very benign form of socialism that's very accepted. My son, and I won't give away a bottle for this one, but can anybody guess which one is my son? <laughs> my son wanted to play basketball. Okay. He's now, uh, he wanted to get into a really good school, and when he came to live with me from his mother's house in the ninth grade, it was three weeks into the school year, basketball tryouts had already passed, so he couldn't try out that year. In his sophomore year, he went to try out again, and the coach said, if you didn't play last year, you can't play this year. Because in Canada, they don't have athletic scholarships because that would mean that somebody's actually doing better than, than other people, which is frowned upon. So they have a very low quality of coaching staff. So if you've played last year, then you can come in. If not, I can't really coach you. In his junior year, he tried out again, and they said, this year, we're not looking for tall kids. We're looking for short kids, okay? 
got to give the short kids a chance, okay? So he couldn't get in again. And in his senior year, they said, we just don't have enough jerseys. Now, Rick is six foot seven, okay? And you can't teach tall. A good coach can teach an athletic person willing to play basketball, but you can't teach tall. So Canadian socialism, the way it works is, let's give the short kids a chance. Okay, so he didn't get in. Now, incidentally, he's just starting on his uh, PhD in public choice theory at Suffolk College. So he, he made it out okay, even without, without basketball. Got a video here. I taped an interview when I was, last time I was up in Canada. This is healthcare explained in the words of a Canadian. She's a 67-year-old retired school teacher, and she refused to give her city, and she refused to give her full name because she was afraid that the physician would retaliate and fire her. Because if a doctor fires a patient in Canada, you can't get another doctor, okay? You are SOL. So th that's why I only refer to her by her first name and the city where she's from, not where she currently lives. Okay, go ahead. How I feel is that, I said a lot of times even in teaching, um, the, the, the system exists uh, for, the, for the system of, of education rather than for the student. Right. And I almost feel that a lot of times with health care. Mm -hmm. Health care doesn't exist for the patient. Right. I think the difference that I felt between the Mayo Clinic and going here for, in Canada was that at the Mayo Clinic, they're not perfect. Now, I don't mean to, I, I'm, I'm a realist. Mm -hmm. they're, they make errors too. But the system there was really trying to put the patient number one. Mm -hmm. What I find in our health care here, it's a system that's number one. And uh, then about 1983, I went back myself just for a second opinion, mm -hmm. because my family had gone for second opinions. And I think that's how we got introduced to outside health care, was to getting uh -huh. second opinions. Because in the system, we found it very difficult to get a second opinion that wasn't part of the system. And then we, my husband, uh, he was misdiagnosed in Saskatoon, and uh, we got a second opinion in Saskatoon, and they never acted on that. Mm -hmm. So then we went to the Mayo Clinic. My husband's alive today, and having a, a half-decent lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, not because the system here couldn't have done it, not because we have a fantastic heart specialist that we were going to, mm -hmm. uh, but we found him after mm -hmm. we needed right. him. You know, we got him after we went to the Mayo Clinic and came back. But before that, he, he just got missed and mm -hmm. uh, misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Which again, like I said, I don't expect anybody to be perfect. But where do you go for a second opinion? We went to the second guy, and the second guy uh, said, "No, oh, nothing wrong." And mm -hmm. but there, we knew he couldn't walk 50 feet. Mm -hmm. And I, I went back to my family doctor and said, "I counseled the surgeon," and he said, "You can't do that." And I said, "Well, I have." Mm -hmm. How can you? And I said, because I've got it done. One week later, I'm back mm -hmm. in his office. And what's more interesting was uh, this particular doctor, when his wife got breast cancer, phoned me mm -hmm. to just see what the system was like oh, down really? there. And I uh, thought that was impressive. Yeah, For me, it was impressive. Yeah. I felt I didn't make the wrong decision. I can understand the average person who doesn't have to deal with the health system at all mm -hmm. saying that it is, because I was extremely pleased with my right. knee. Okay. Extremely pleased with the doctor. Uh, I thought it was wonderful, but mm -hmm. I just thank God that it wasn't anything more serious. Mm -hmm. For example, my mother had open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. The procedure is that after the open heart surgery, one day special care, not mm -hmm. one day intensive care, two days in special care, mm -hmm. and then you go into a, a, um, a just on the floor in one right. of the ordinary wards, uh -huh. and in two days you go home. Mm -hmm. Now that's the system. But mm -hmm. the end of that time, my mother wasn't capable of going home, but she had to go home anyway. Mm -hmm because the system couldn't change. Oh, really? they, you know, they, there's a, there was a process for her that, oh. you, you know, if you fall into the system, right. you're okay. Oh. But if you happen to step out of it, it's very hard to get back into right. it. I don't mean that the individual doctor doesn't care, right. but he's working in a system that doesn't allow him the potential to work the way he wants to. Right. I think the doctors have a hard life hands are tied mm -hmm. and right. they can't tell you the patient what's really going on because mm -hmm. uh, they're they're really tied if I'm scared to say something mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. even imagine how much they must be yeah. uh, limited in what they speak out because we mm -hmm. all have to keep living and surviving how 
What I find really sad, though, is like I said, when we went out, it's that we didn't get a thing done out there that couldn't have been done here. Mm -hmm. It's just that we couldn't get access to it. Right. And you would say, oh, well, you know, if you really need it, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. Well, it just depends how the system can manage to get you in. Like, right. And you can't blame one one person. Right. I think we have to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. When I go outside of the system, it's not against any system. Mm -hmm. It's for me taking personal responsibility for myself. Mm -hmm. okay. And some of us worked hard to save some money so we could do that. I would love to buy a bigger motor home. And I'd love mm -hmm. to fly another trip somewhere. But we don't because mm -hmm. you never know yeah. when we'll need it. We have to take responsibility yeah. for ourselves. I'd sell my house. Uh -huh. I'd sell my car. I would, I would sell everything mm -hmm. if I had to have health care. I mean, once you're, when you're really critically ill, money means nothing. Right. I've looked after, my husband was ill when he was 54 and couldn't work. Mm -hmm. And I looked after my dad, I looked after my mom through a couple open heart surgeries, I looked after my husband and mom. Uh, you know, I've been around health care issues all my life and I still save money for my own health care. Mm -hmm. I save it so I, if I have to emergency back by air ambulance to the Mayo Clinic, I can So this interview was completely unscripted. I, I asked very few questions. She just talked and talked. And you probably noticed the most common word was the system, OK? Because that's what it is. It's the system. And Canadians are afraid to ask the doctor, well, you know, why do you recommend that kind of care? Are there any alternatives? Because the doctor will feel challenged. and. In a, in a system where the doctor can fire the patient and where a great many number of Canadians don't have a primary care physician and therefore no access to a specialist, the last thing a Canadian wants to do is get fired by their doctor because then they have nothing. They have nothing. So they live in fear. They live in fear of challenging the system and, and they hope that if they need it, it's there for them, but they know it probably won't be. Okay, this is, you know, like I said, this, the attitudes of Canadians are, are incredible and you have to really understand inside their heads so that you can appreciate what, what's going to happen here eventually. Um, uninsured in Canada. How many people knew that there are uninsured Canadians in Canada? Good. Uh, roughly 3 to 5 percent of the population of Canada are uninsured. And uh, the uninsured Canadians have even harder access, uh, you know, than the insured because in Canada you cannot pay a physician for care. You cannot pay direct. It's not a two-tier system. Canada is one of two, one of only two uh, true single-payer systems in the world. 16.8% of Canadians do not have a primary care physician in some parts of the country. In, in Quebec, for example, it's, it's over 30%, 34%. And if you don't have access to a primary care physician, you can't get a referral to a specialist. So you have to go to the government clinic, the free clinic, uh, and, and it's much harder to get a referral from a walk-in clinic than it is from your primary care doctor who knows you. Um, it's one of two countries that has a true single-payer system where it is illegal to pay a physician. It's actually illegal for a physician, for a physician to accept payment. Now, Test question for the bottle of Shivas. What is the other country? Cuba. Not Cuba. North Korea, very good. Okay, Dr. Shivak, you've got the Shivas. Remember that when, okay. When we, when we hear single payer here, we think about government medicine, okay? But true single payer means there's no copay for anything. There's no coinsurance. There's no deductible. There, there's no, you know, skin in the game for the patient. And the patient cannot pay for private care. Now, as Dr. Shaoli was telling us yesterday, what they do by rationing is when they find that a certain, uh, you know, treatment or something like that is, is utilized at a higher rate, they delist it. Just like in 10 care, they delisted three drugs that accounted for 44% of the 10 care budget. 
uh, in Canada, they delist services. They delisted chiropractors and massage therapists and physiotherapists because people were using them too much. Uh, of course, prescription drugs are not covered in Canada at all under the, the you know, socialized medicine. They're not covered. So by delisting services, that's how they're trying to keep the expenditures down. Uh, and of course, uh, as Dr. Sholey also said, by limiting the, um, limiting the um, amount of reimbursement to the physician, they limit the time spent, and therefore they try to push more patients through. Now we talk about the uninsured. What we're seeing in Canada is signs coming up in hospitals now because there's more and more uninsured all the time. Here's a sign, look at this. This is in British Columbia, outpatient charges. This is in ER. BC resident, $169 with no medical coverage. Out of province, $169 with mo no medical coverage. Out of country, $500. Physician, $320. So total for out of country is $820. But again, BC resident, no medical ch coverage. Okay? Uninsured Canadians. This one is in Ontario. ER rate schedule. It, you know, nice fancy sign. It's got the three holes to hang it up by. <laughs> Emergency room hospital charge excludes physician's fee. Non-residents of Canada, 320. Uninsured Canadians, no valid OHIP card, 150. So if you can prove that you're Canadian but you're uninsured, it's only 150. They will not see you. They will not see you without paying unless you're unconscious or it's life-threatening. My sister is a psychiatric nurse in British Columbia. Uh, a patient was admitted by the police that was suicidal, about to jump from a bridge on you know, drugs or, or something, and he was uninsured. And they said, sorry, it's not life-threatening. You know, attempted suicide isn't life-threatening. <laughs> I can't figure that one out, but I guess it didn't meet the definition. So he was refused. He was refused service and go to the free clinic tomorrow. Um, additional charges again. If you're insured, you, can't, you cannot do this. You cannot pay. But if you're uninsured, you can actually pay for some of these services. Um, now, how are people uninsured in Canada? Well, first of all, you have to understand that in Canada, there, there's not one national health system. There is the Canada Health Act, which is about 13 pages long, not 2,700. Each province has to comply with the Canada Health Act to get federal funding. But each province runs its own health care scheme. In some provinces, you have to pay premium. In others, the employer has to pay your premium. And in others, it's just covered in general tax revenue. Those where it's covered in general tax revenue, there's relatively few uninsured. Those where you have to pay premium, if you don't pay taxes or if you live under a bridge, guess what? You're uninsured. Okay. Now, you're eligible but you're uninsured. Just like here, we have people eligible for Medicare, but not enrolled, okay? So the, the term uninsured, if I presented myself and I said, well, I'm eligible because I'm a Canadian citizen, but I, don't, I haven't filed tax return in years, so I don't have a government health card, then I'm uninsured. I can apply for, you know, I would, I would have to apply for welfare, file back taxes, and then there's, you know, three to six month wait. So I could eventually get coverage, but I'm currently not insured. Me measures of effectiveness. This is, this is also a very good one that we hear when we hear, you know, the Canadian and other systems of socialized medicine compared uh, to our system. And, and we, we, you know, we talk about cost, percent of GDP and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the most common two measures of effectiveness are infant mortality and life expectancy. Infant mortality is measured differently in every different country. There are some countries, believe it or not, that have zero infant mortality in the first 24 hours. In the United States, it's 41%. 41% of first year mortality occurs in the first 20, 24 hours. That makes sense. Because, and I don't need to tell you this, I know this, but definition of live birth is any sign of life. Involuntary twitch, boom, he's alive, okay? In some countries, before you're considered a live birth, you have to be, in Switzerland, I think it's 30 centimeters or 24, something like that. You have to you know, be a certain size. In some countries, you have to live 24 hours. In some countries, you actually have to be able to say, niet, comrade, before you're considered a live birth. Okay. 
So it's different. It's different country to country. Uh, life expectancy, of course, we all know that that, that has some bearing on, on medical treatment, but not a whole lot. Gunshot wounds, uh, motor vehicle fatality, there's some things that are just different. If you stripped out all the violent crime and motor vehicle fatalities, the United States would have the highest life expectancy in the West, Western world. So some of these measures of effectiveness are not really all that valid. Okay. Um, and of course, we, we, we do know that people come here from all over the world for the really complex care, okay? They continue to come here. So if our measures of effectiveness are so bad, why do they keep coming? Cost, effect, uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, in Canada, they spend about 9.9% of GDP. However, about a third of all medical care is out of pocket. In the United States, it's under 14%, okay? Uh, again, they pay for shorter encounters because I think the pay, and, and somebody last night asked a question of Dr. Shaoli, I think it was Dr. Schiller that asked, if I remember correctly, uh, about, I think the question was how much do they pay for a visit? Uh, it varies province to province. A regular follow-up visit in British Columbia is $13.46. Okay, so how much care can you provide for that? Um, 33 percent out-of-pocket cost. Dental is not covered at all. In Canada, prescription medications are not covered, chiropractor, physiotherapy. Uh, you cannot get a physical in Canada unless you need it for employment purposes, in which case you're allowed to pay. If you have a pilot's license or a truck driver license, then you can actually pay. But you cannot get a you know, wellness checkup, routine health care. You can't. Because it has been proven in Canada that preventative medicine does not save money. Yeah, it saves lives, but it doesn't save money. Because you have to diagnose, you know, you have to do a checkup on so many people to find one or two treatable early stage diseases. It, it's a whole lot more cost effective just to let them get to stage four, give them some morphine and, you know, put them on an ice flow. You know, that's, that's the government. That's global budgeting. Okay. And Canadians just accept that. You know, that's cool. We don't want tall kids on the basketball team. We want to give the short kids a chance and, you know, can't have somebody taking more health care than, than they deserve. Because universal health care is actually a lie. It's actually unachievable. It's unattainable. Because it assumes that every single person is entitled to the same amount of health care. From the 23-year-old athlete to the 89-year-old cancer patient, they're all entitled to the same. So it attempts to deliver the same amount. So, you know, the cancer patient gets not enough. The 23-year-old gets too much. And, and, and the, that's where the breakdown is. It's in the temp because you wouldn't want somebody to get more health care than somebody else. That would be so unfair. Um, they've talked in Canada about two-tier. They've talked about a parallel private system, but the, the way the Canadians feel is that, uh, you know, if, if you have 10 shopping carts in front of you at Albertsons and you're checking out, and a second lineup opens and then four move out, now you're number six instead of number 11, okay? But the guy in front of you used to be number 10, and now he's number four, so that's no fair. Okay, and that's their attitude. And it's really, it's interesting because Canadian, Canadians define themselves two ways. Number one, they have free health care. Number two, they define themselves as being not American. Okay, so those are the two ways that Canadians define themselves. Um, let's talk a little bit about statistics. Wait times to see uh, specialists are very high and they vary from place to place. Um, oh, here, here was my, my other question. For a bottle of Crown Royal, okay, um, how much does the U.S. Army pay for a toilet seat? $1,200. Dr. Watson, okay, you've got the Crown Royal. Okay, so we talk about government medicine being cost effective with $1,200 toilet seats? I don't think so. Um, in some provinces, it's 35 weeks for a sonogram, or not sonogram, ultra, same thing, uh, 117 weeks for neurosurgery, 130 weight, 138 to see an orthopedic surgeon. So, so some Canadians, where my mother lives in Kelowna, British Columbia, they actually go to see a veterinarian because there's no dermatologist, okay? And since the vets earn more than medical doctors, they're usually brighter, 
They're, they're the brighter students say, hey, you know, I work this hard for 89,000 a year. I can make 170 as a vet, you know? No, no government interference, so they become vets. So the seniors go and see the vets. Uh, a dog in Canada can get an MRI in one to two days. Person will wait 13 months. Here's a chart from the Fraser Institute, and I've just highlighted a few. Uh, these are the different provinces. PE is Prince Edward Island, uh, 33.8 weeks for gynecology. Neurosurgery in New Brunswick, 116 weeks. Orthopedic surgery, 138. Urology, 63. So these are, these are just the wait times to get in to see a specialist and, and you know, get cared for. And the Canadian government's very, very proud of their statistics because they now, they have recently published the fact that in 30% of the provinces, they meet the, the worst possible wait time 75% of the time. Okay, so congratulations on achieving mediocrity. 30% <laughs> of the provinces, 75% of the time, they meet the wait times. Now, uh, is Canadian-style medicine coming here? Is that what this government wants? It's all about control. It's all about Politicare in Canada when there's an election coming up because it's not every four, fourth year and the first Tuesday in November. It's when the Prime Minister calls it. And the Prime Minister is not elected, he's appointed. So in Canada, when there's going to be an election, the pollsters know when there's going to be an election because the wait times for knees and hips decreases from two and a half years to one and a half years. And they say there's going to be an election because the seniors vote, so they decrease these wait times. So it's all about maintaining power. It's not about, you know that. It's not about helping the people. Uh, the the doctor-to-patient ratio in Canada is 2.1. Uh, I think here it's 2.8. Um, and of course, they're not paying them to see the patients. So they see dogs at night, you know? Use the MRI machine. Can't use it at night for patients, but you can use it for dogs. And, you know, patients are suffering. So we've, we've got to fight for patient freedom. And, and I know this group is. I know APPS members are. Uh, we need to talk to our colleagues, and we need to get them in on the fight. You know, get, get them in on this battle to fight for patient freedom, because the patients are very clear. Patients know what they want, and they know what they don't want. They know what's acceptable. So who's going to fight for them? Um, in Canada, how can they get care? Well, let's look, let's look at this, this video here. Also, an interview with Edith. I didn't find them that expensive. Everyone says how outrageously expensive. Uh -huh. I didn't find that one night. $360 for the hospital room. Um, the operating room was $475 one time, $350 another time. Mm -hmm. Um, all together we came home with everything, like all the different tests and they had to give you like a mini physical before they could put you right. up for the lymph nodes and everything. Okay. Yeah. I think it was like $12,000. My husband and I saved our little bit of money for health care. Mm -hmm. Especially when they talk about how you in your last six months of your life use all your health care. Right, right. But I say that's what I worked all my life and paid taxes for. Right. Was so the last six months of my life I could have health care love to be my dog. My dog just had a $3,000 surgery. Mm -hmm. Would you believe they phone me every day for a couple of days after mm -hmm. to make sure he's okay? And yeah. I don't mean that the individual doctor doesn't care, right. but he's working in a system that doesn't allow him the potential to work the way he wants to. Right. I think the doctors have a hard life. Their hands are tied mm -hmm. and right. they can't tell you the patient what's really going on because mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're really tired. So in, in retrospect, you feel that spending $12,000 of your own money could quite likely have saved your life? Absolutely. They talk about it being more expensive. My room at the Mayo Clinic that I had at the hospital now, um, uh, I can't remember which hospital I was in because St. Mary's is one. I wasn't in that one. Mm -hmm. I was in the other one mm -hmm. in, in, um, at Rochester, Minnesota. Right. And my room was $360 for the night. I had my own television, mm -hmm. I had stereo speakers, mm -hmm. I had my own phone, mm -hmm. I had a push button to the nursing station 100% of the time. I'm not just sure that the American system is more extensive. We have a company called Medibid, okay. which allows you to go online on the computer and put down your health profile and what kind of treatment you want. 
and then doctors from throughout the U.S. and overseas will provide a bid on providing that care. So you'll have different bids and you can look at their medical background, their experience, their training and then make the decision so you know the price is going in. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. We would have used that. So Canadians will pay for access to care. They don't have the mortgage deduction in Canada so because of that, uh, they tend to pay off their mortgages early in life, okay? And then they can mortgage their house. Now they have very high taxes, they have very high costs, so they don't have as much disposable income, GDP per capita is lower, but they'll mortgage the house, a couple hundred grand if they need to. They just want care, that's all they want. And they know they can't get it in Canada. And they know that throwing more money at, at this problem won't, won't solve it. So, one thing that's very prevalent is bribing the doctor. If you want to get a referral and you're lucky enough to have a primary care doctor, you put 10 $100 bills in an envelope and you seal it, put the doctor's name on the front when you go in, here you go Dr. Smith, um, you know, anything you could do to expedite the referral would be greatly appreciated. It magically happens, okay? It, it's, in, in a developed socialist system, there is so much black market. Everybody in Canada makes their own wine and beer because a, you know, a dozen beer will cost you $30, so they make their own. Cheap bottle of wine costs $16, so they make their own wine. If you want to see a doctor, if you want to see a specialist, you bribe the doctor. Travel to the U.S. for care. <clears throat> The problem with that is the perceived cost because they see our charge master prices, you know, the build rates, and, and that scares them. And most Canadians are convinced that it's really expensive. So you have these overseas medical tourism brokers that promote care in India and Thailand and, and Costa Rica for 15000 you know, for a procedure that they claim would cost 60000 in the U.S. Okay, it's billed at 60, it's not paid at 60. So there's this perception. So these uh, medical tourism people are, are shipping people overseas for perceived savings. So we're, we're trying to offer them options. And, and after we came down here five years ago, we continued bringing our patients down for care. We were doing it one-on-one, -on -one, just calling around. Uh, after the last election, that's when we built, that's when we went on high gear and Medibid and we built it so that Canadians can get access. And right now we're talking to the government of Ontario, Alberta and British Columbia to outsource their, some of their specialty care, their excess capacity that they can't get to. We've developed a financial model. We're talking to some of the disability carriers, the workers comp. Okay, so we're talking to some governments to get some patients going. We, we've been open for patients since January, but we haven't done a whole lot of marketing. Okay, because we've been trying to build up the number of physicians that are enrolled. But we're going after these, these governments right now. Now, the, for, for the final bottle, which is, I think, the Grey Goose. Okay, for a bottle of Grey Goose, can anybody name a Canadian politician that has traveled to the U.S. for care in the last three years? Steve Harper? I don't know if Steve Harper went. Do you know the name? Do you know his name? Okay, closest answer, Danny Williams. And, and what he said, Danny Williams, Premier of, of Newfoundland said, my heart, my health, my choice. Okay, and he came for care. So, all the great goose for Tamsin. Um, <clears throat> Canadians do have options, they don't always understand them, but we're trying to, we're trying to help them. And, and of course, you know, we, we have American patients on Medibit as well, we have a lot. But uh, we're, we're, you know, we started it initially with the intent of helping Canadians. And right now about 40% of our patients are Canadians. Um, and let me see, here is the system. Now of course, we have until Thanksgiving, a six month free, free trial, six month free for any APPS member, okay? So it's, it's absolutely free. Not free as in free healthcare, but really free. Um, what, we've, what we've heard from our patients is, is very interesting. Um, oh, okay, let me show you some of the outreach in Canada. We've got bus ads running in uh, 16 different cities with things like this, okay? This URL goes right to Medibid. So uh, we've gotten a lot of knee replacement requests from these. 
And we've gotten a lot of media attention in Canada too. And some of them are really shocked. I mean, this is really shocked. You know, private health care? You know, what are you suggesting? So the, the media interviews have been really interesting. Uh, what our patients are telling us is, is really, 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 really interesting. We've been in healthcare finance in the US and in Canada for many years, for 15 years. Patients' demands are changing in Canada and in the US, okay? They don't want, they don't want the six minute visit. They don't. When we did a survey of, of apps doctors a couple of years ago, I guess, we compiled the results from the survey and, and we asked questions about, uh, tell us about your Medicare patients, your Medicaid, your private insurance and your cash pay. How many patients in each category, how many dollars of revenue and how many visits per year? What we identified, no surprise, was the Medicare patients had the highest number of visits per year, no surprise. Second highest was cash pay patients. Why would cash pay patients? I would have thought insurance or, you know, or Medicaid, but it was the cash pay patients. So we did some focus groups with cash pay patients and we said, why? Why do you go more frequently when it costs you a little bit more? What they told us is the reason we go is because when I pay cash, if I pay a $10 copay, I'm getting six, six minutes and a prescription, okay? I, I place zero value on that. I place no value, okay? And the doctors are saying, well, that's all I can afford for 13 bucks, okay? So both sides understand that it's not a good transaction. But when they go and pay their own money, whether it's 50, 75, $200, they say, my doctor spends time with me. My doctor looks at me in the eye. My doctor knows my spouse's name, my kid's names, my dog's name. My doctor gives me an education. My doctor empowers me to take control of my own health. My doctor is Marcus Welby, okay? And that's what people want, and that's what they'll pay for. When we looked at carving out just that cash pay segment of the typical practice, and we, we extrapolated over all of the patient load, what we found is obviously a much more profitable practice, much less billing and admin people needed, but there was another model that was within one dollar of the profitability, and that's a veterinary practice, okay? So vet, veterinary medicine is free market, okay? And cash pay mirrors that. Um, these are, as of about two weeks ago, our open requests. What, what surprised us, and, and these are many of the, 40% of these are from Canada, a lot for primary care. We thought it would be knee replacements and stuff, a lot from primary care, because as I said, in Canada, you can't get a physical. So there's a lot of people that say, I want a physical, okay? The only way you can get a physical in Canada, unless you're a pilot or, or a truck driver, is apply for life insurance, and then they'll draw blood. And, they do diagnose a lot of things on an on a, you know, insurance physical, but, it, but it's not a real physical. You know, it's, it's a nurse just asking health questions and drawing blood. So we have a lot of people that want primary care, but they're asking for cash doctors. They're asking for, for Marcus Welby, okay? So they, they know what they want. And let's see. Okay, of course our equipment portal, I just wanted to mention that quick. We just opened that this week. If you have, you know, a physician has any exam tables, stethoscope, filing cabinets, office stuff, you can trade that on MediBid, buy and sell. And so we have cash patients, many from Canada. Can we treat them? Can you take care of Canadians? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much.